The Curious Case of HMS Ark Royal, 91. From, well, a construction perspective. You see, at a certain point, the Royal Navy is making some decisions about where or not to build this carrier. And it is actually this file in the National Archives, the file about Atrium Snark Royal, which started me off down the whole rabbit hole of what happened to the Admiral class. What exactly went on in terms of naval aviation in the early part of the 19 1910s. And it really annoyed me because it took about I'd say, I spent about four and a half months of my PhD thesis research time hunting through this, doing as much as I could within the financial limits I had at the time. And whenever a historian or academic or someone like that says they've done research to the best of their ability, what they mean is their best of their financial ability. And what I came back with, from all the documents I managed to see, was an absolutely certain, rock-solid, would stake any amount of money on it, belief, that the aircraft carrier which the Camelairs had previously worked on that had been, designed, had been going to be for a large strike carrier had been their Admiral class battle cruiser. HMS Hal. It's, it's an Admiral class. People, you know, as I said, it's, uh, people when I start talking about this always look at me strange and go, no, they cancelled the battle cruisers. Well, they didn't. They were mostly paused in construction, and they slowly are cancelled, But and this, some of them are dismantled in situ, but they sit there, some of them, for quite a while. In fact, a pair of them seem to sit there for a very long time. And then you look at the notes, and the notes are, we're looking for, it's a 70 to 80 aircraft carrier, it's a large carrier, and... In the internal documents, they're saying over John Brown, over all these other amazing companies Britain has. Oh no, Camel Airs. We go to Camel Airs because they're the experts in large carriers. And go through their project list. For Ark Royal, there's no carrier completed. There's certainly no carrier started. No design. Nothing. Nothing like that is put in. So what are the options? What are the options? Well, how? HMS how? That's it. It also fits the timeline. We know when the Royal Navy's Harbour Attack Committee, is well, the Harbour Attack Committee of the Royal Navy, but also the... Um, Committee for Imperial Def uh, the uh, Committee for Imperial Defence. They're talking about using aircraft. We know the plans that even BT has at various points for striking Wilhelmshaven involve launching mass air attacks. They've been looking at getting bigger and bigger carriers involved, and you have this big, big ship, one of the largest hulls ever built for the Royal Navy. And yeah, you don't want to complete it as a battle cruiser. You don't. You want to use more knowledge to put in a new... Uh, it's new. But for aircraft carrier... For aircraft carrier, you're already doing Eagle. It's already sort of being worked on this point. It, it's not strange to start thinking of maybe converting a battle cruiser. In fact, it's more sensible, really, to converting a battle cruiser. Courageous and Glorious will survive thanks to BT and his choices and his desires for certain types and sizes of sh uh, ships, but 
you have to consider the option that if BT had gone another way, and if the treaties had been in any way slower in implementing, there is a real chance that HMS Howe, at least, gets completed as an aircraft carrier. Maybe she becomes another exception, like Hood. The British end up with two exceptions to the rules. Hood, which everyone's blinking past on the treaties because she weighs so much and has such a distant displacement, and it could be the same on how. Um, yeah, they have a giant aircraft carrier. We're going to ignore that. Because it's best to ignore it. Because of what, if we try and get the thumb to get rid of it, they will leave the tri they won't stay in the treaty system. Internal documents. And it's not as if Camel Airs doesn't have a lot of work going on. They are always building ships for the Royal Navy. They're always working with the Royal Navy. But they don't have any other aircraft carriers before Ark Royal. Not officially. Nothing I can point to. And even this, I can tell you I am 100% certain of it. But can I point to a single document that says so? No. I can point to plans and go, there's discussions and this fits with those changes and this, these, this details from this discussion fit with these details on the plans. So they fit. But I don't have a bridging document. I don't have a document which allows me to neatly tie it up and go to you and go, I can put this in a book. And that's annoying. But Camel Erds did do a lot of work. Admittedly, they also built HMS Rodney, the Nelson class battleship. So there's a lot of money going backwards and forwards between the Royal Navy and <laughs> that lovely, particularly wonderful yard. But there's not an aircraft carrier. I'd always been fascinated by the story of Ark Royal, and the story of her is one of the reasons why I got into tribal class destroyers, because they like to follow her around, a lot, especially when she's first entered service. Again, it's another one of those scenarios where it would be churlish to suggest she wouldn't have been lost if she had tribals as escorts instead of destroyer she did have. But, and especially considering that most of her loss you can place down to... We'll get, we'll get into some of the issues around that. We'll get into the issues around the loss of, the loss of and the damage control scenario going there. But again, she is often escorted by the very best. She spends a large chunk of World War II operating with HMS Renown as her buddy. And that's Force H. That is Force H. Renown, Ark Royal, Sheffield. That is Force H. There are destroyers grouped around them, and yes, they are frigging important. And absolutely vital. But if you wanted the headline axe, you've got Renown, you've got Ark Royal, and you've got Sheffield. And good lord, no one really wants to take on those three. That's not a good night out for anyone who's fighting the Royal Navy. So. The Royal Navy goes to the yard they describe as their finest builders of large aircraft carriers. So their best yard to build large aircraft carriers. Their experienced yard to build large aircraft carriers. Which has, as far as any of us can tell, as, as I can ever see, because... There's only no, so many carriers which serve in the Royal Navy. Hasn't actually built one before Ark Royal. And whilst I could see them maybe putting the flannel on to politicians, openly lying is unusual because that's easy to disprove. And they don't need to lie internally. Camel Earths is a good enough name, they don't need to make up facts to support it. Of 
And what are they building this carrier for? Well, first things first, it's not being built for the Pacific. Although, its orientation of its design does have advantages for Pacific operations. It is not being built for the Pacific. The Royal Navy can't afford to build an aircraft carrier for the Pacific, because they're probably going to end up needing to use it in the Mediterranean and Atlantic, which is what happens. The Royal Navy has to maintain naval forces in the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean, the South Atlantic, North Atlantic, Arctic, Antarctic. Pretty much everywhere there is a British Empire, there is a Royal Navy warship wandering around. And wherever there's a Royal Navy warship wandering around, occasionally it'll be visited by a cruiser. And the Royal Navy has to be prepared that sometimes they are going to have to deploy their battleships, their aircraft carriers, and other major units to those areas to fight battles. Because that is the reality of the Royal Navy. You can be called anywhere on seven tenths of the world's surface to defend the world's largest empire in the 1920s and 30s. You cannot afford to be in a scenario going, well, you know, we have seven aircraft carriers. But, uh, yeah, that one's built for the Pacific and this is an Atlantic operation, and uh, we have three built for the Atlantic and two are not available, so we only have one carrier. That doesn't really wash. So why does she look so different to the armoured carriers which come afterwards? Well, because of where she's supposed to be positioned in the fleet. Remember the Royal Navy likes to do multi-carrier operations. The armoured hangar carriers, the illustrious class, they were supposed to keep with the fleet. With the battle fleet. They're going to provide their cap and their constant strike. HMS Ark Royal is supposed to be hanging back. She is the Alpha Strike Specialist. Again, this explains similarities between the Americans and the Japanese, who both do focus on the Alpha Strike, i.e. the forming up your air wing into as big a strike as possible, and whoom! It's the big heavy hit. Approach. Whereas the Royal Navy is looking at the, 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 the constant hits, the death of a thousand cuts scenario on their opponent. But they do appreciate the big whoomp, and they know they need the capability to do the big whoomp for a couple of scenarios. One, major fleet battles. It'd be quite it's quite useful to be able to deliver the big whoomp, especially if you're targeting enemy carriers. Two enemy fleet sitting in harbour. Mm-hmm. They have an entire subcommittee of the Compinity of Imperial Defence called the Harbour Attack Committee. They spend a lot of time working out how to attack uh, how to attack enemy fleets hiding in harbours. One thing you always have to remember about the Royal Navy is World War II is them exercising a lot of their trauma from World War One. The reason all their cruisers carry hydrophones or ASDEC, Abdukur Cressy Hogue. The reason they have Ark Royal, they have uh, in a navy which is developing its naval aviation around doing all these sorts of things, they do have an Alpha Strike orientated capital ship, is literally because of Wilhelmshaven. But also because the Royal Navy, as I've said again in Atrius Illustrious' video on this series, really, really wanted a carrier which had a Ark Royal sized air group with an illustrious size armor deployment. That's what they wanted. But you couldn't have both and build enough carriers underneath the treaty system. You just couldn't. Basically, you're talking something indef indefatigable, audacious sized. It would be the Royal Navy's dream carrier. With that kind of profile layout. And they couldn't have that. Not under the treaty system and not good enough. So they had this. And it still was armoured. It has a four and a half inch belt. It has a three and a half inch armoured deck over the lower part of the vessel. 
And that's often the difference, okay? The difference between an armoured hangar vessel, a sort of uh, like, vessel like the illustrious class, and an Ark Royal style vessel is they have uh, one has armour protecting the hull, so whilst the top might burn off and be destroyed, the bottom should still keep it floating, the ship should still be viable, able to get home and be repaired. Whereas the illustrious class are designed to take hits and keep on working and be able to be more easily repaired. So one is the asset which you send into a higher risk position, i.e. one hangs out with the main fleet and one sits a little bit further back with probably a vessel like HMS Unicorn, which is the supply ship to make up for the fact that this has a lot more engineering and maintenance space and of course this whole second hangar versus the illustrious class which don't. And their hangers are far taller in Nitrous Arc Royal. They really are. It's amazing when you're not putting four and a half inch armoured belt on the level, the hanger level. Amazing how much bigger you can build your space wise your carrier. It's, it's just. It's shocking, really. It really is. And. She is built with all the knowledge of this. She's one of the first constructors or constructions ordered by Admiral Henderson when he becomes Third Sea Lord. She's one of the first things he starts working up. He's Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers, that's his former post, he's now become Third Sea Lord. One of the first things he starts working on is Ark Royal. And one of the first things he also works on is turning the integrated doctrine of naval aviation, which he sort of started to develop as Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers, into something which the Royal Navy can evolve from and use. Now, they are still facing several issues. One of the things that you have in her design, which you won't have in later carriers, but you do have in Lustrous class still, is the designing space for dealing with the fact that you have Royal Air Force personnel aboard not integrated within the ship's, uh, the ship's crew. Okay. So unlike the modern system done today where the poor Air Force personnel have to go, uh, when they're coming in as part of the tailored air group, and the Army personnel have to go through various trainings to get them integrated into damage control, so they can be put anywhere in the hull accommodation-wise and lump it. That's a naval mess. Go and enjoy it. It's better than a tent. In the 1920s and 30s, the Royal Air Force insisted that they had special accommodations and special facilities for their personnel. Which, of course, used up space and weight on an aircraft carrier. Two things which are well-known aircraft carriers have a lot of space and weight. For personnel to be acting like they are completely separate from the ship's crew. And what was really interesting was the personnel themselves didn't act like they were separate from a ship's crew. They were integrated quite quickly. It was the air ministry and the higher-ups who tried to be weird about it. And would often cause trouble when they turned up and were going, well, why are you guys messing with each other? And it's a case of, well, because we're stuck in this metal box which sails around the world for several months a year, and frankly, it's either get to know each other and become friendly, or it's have gang warfare. And... The gang warfare front, they bring marines. Um, I'm sorry, um, do, do you really want to, do you really think me, us, should take on marines? Marine sitting over in the corner, casually, you know, I don't know, sharpening their nails with a rock or something. No. Ark Royal is probably one of the most famous ships in World War II, and that's amazing considering how long she actually serves. Because she's commissioned in December 1938, and she's sunk, lost, in November 1941. Yes. She's gone before Pearl Harbor. Nineteen thirty nine, nineteen forty, nineteen forty one. So he missions out on nineteen forty two, nineteen forty three, and nineteen forty five.
would have been jolly useful to have. But leaving that to one side, let's consider the name she's given. The battle honours for Ark Royal read as the Spanish Armada, 1588. Cadiz, 1596. Dardanelles, 1915. Norway, 1940. Spadevento, 1940. Mediterranean, 1940-41. The Malta Convoys, 1941. Bismarck, 1941. Her motto. Designer par repos. Zeal does not rest. Suits her. It really does. Now, there are lots of interesting discussion points about Ark Royal and her capabilities. The fact is, she was the first carrier built with her flight deck as her strength deck. And why does this matter? Well, because if you build your flight deck as a strength deck, that's the first point to which you can start thinking about putting armor on it. So she is an important stepping stone to become, uh, to be creating the armored carriers. It also means you can make the flight deck stronger. And strength deck means literally that. It's part of the structural integrity of the ship. It's not just a deck which has been added on top. It's not in the nicest way, it's not just some superstructure. It is part of the structural integrity of the ship. And that was why the flight deck was built from 19mm thick Ducol steel plating. And also, this had the advantage of enclosing the hangar decks within the hull girder. This gives them increased splinter protection to the hangars. It gives them increased structural protection. It makes them less likely to warp, and it gives them, to an extent, more strong places from which to use to maintain uh, maintain aircraft. I, there are lots of more places that you can dangle stuff off which you can then use as impromptu cranes to lift and move stuff. Free lifts. That's another useful addition. But mostly, what she is, and what she serves as for the Royal Navy, are sort of different things. Because she is created and serves under her first captain, Captain Arthur, pa Arthur Power, as a strike carrier. That is what the Royal Navy's view about her is. She's going to be their alpha punch. And you can tell that from her first squadrons. First aircraft, Blackburn Skewer, with 800 squadron. Then Fa a Fairy Swordfish, of 810 squadron. Fairy Swordfish of 820 Squadron. Fairy Swordfish of 821 Squadron. These all join her in January 1939. In fact, she maintains the utility of even Blackburn, more Blackburn skewers and rocks from April 1939, and is always being looked at as the offensively armed warship. That's her role. She's to an extent therefore picking up on the role which has sort of been done by the courageous and glorious in their service. Uh, they have been sort of used as the test bed for this role. And originally they wanted to fit with a more aircraft, and I think if they'd gone with deck edge lifts, they probably could have fitted with more aircraft. But again, as I mentioned in the illustrious class video, there are issues with deck edge lifts as far as the Royal Navy is concerned. There are issues, issues with deck parking as far as the Royal Navy is concerned. It's mostly called the North Atlantic. It has a habit of nicking their aircraft. That's going to do a funny thing to a Navy. You know, if you keep losing aircraft off your decks and waves, it's going to do a funny thing to you. It's going to make you start. It's going to make you worry about it. 
Okay, it's gonna it's gonna make you very worried about it. And one of the things I find interesting at the moment is that I have had honest conversations with current naval personnel about the sheer number of tie-down positions on the Queen Elizabeth class's deck. And scenario places where they can make sure they're locked in and properly put it in place. And there was one young officer who I had this discussion with and who went... We had this discussion and the officer said, we've lost aircraft off the deck. The senior officer. Who, the, the younger officer had had a conversation with the senior officer. The senior officer said, we've lost aircraft off the deck in the past. The Royal Navy doesn't forget. And so this young officer, when they bumped into me, went, Hi, Doc. Because I taught them when they were at university. I said, When did we lose aircraft off deck? Was it in the 1960s? No, it was the 1920s. And he looked at me and went, 1920s, so over about 100 years ago. Roughly, the Royal Navy doesn't forget. It is the Elephantine Service. It never forgets. And it tries to learn from its mistakes. Now, one of the interesting things that happens when the Ark Royal is being built is the Royal Navy starts looking into damage control on aircraft carriers and how this is going to differ. They've already been looking into this at various other points, but this is the point at which Admiral Henderson, who's third Sea Lord, is and the former Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers is able to really push this through. Why is he pushing it? Why is he getting it through? Well, they've noticed there's a problem when you're doing damage control on an aircraft carrier. You see, there was a traditional point of honour that you basically waited to the last moment in the Royal Navy before you started doing something like counter-flooding. You only did it if you absolutely had to, because it's the enemy's job to try and put water into your hull, not you. And if you're dealing with a ship which has a low metacentric center of height, uh, uh, you know, a low metacentric point uh, of height, um, a center of sort of, oh, you know, it's displacement and things it sort of pivots around, low metacentric height, I can say it properly now. Well, you can do that. But there's a small problem when your ship looks like this. Frigating massive. And there's a lot of weight very high up above the water. And so, the rules are you're supposed to start doing this earlier. But there's a debate in it. Because there were many officers, and there are many logical arguments about not letting water in. Because water will do a lot, will do other damage. It might cause electric cables to go or something else, which is what you're running your pumps off. Um, th there are all sorts of issues which can be caught, uh, can, which can be damaged by water being brought into the hull. So it's a point of debate still. And this is really the issue for aircraft carriers as World War II goes on in terms of damage control. World War II is the first instance where they might have got the theory and the rules right, but a lot of the experience has to be tested. And there's a real problem for services like the Royal Navy, which loses a lot of their experienced damage control officers early in World War II in terms of their aircraft carrier damage control officers. Where they lose them? Glorious and courageous. Because whilst a ship might go to sea with a partial air group, it will never go to sea with a partial damage control group. It will have all the officers aboard. And if you lose those officers, you then have to start bringing in more officers from outside. And that means there's lots of officers coming in who are the right rank and theoretically the right experience and have done the right courses, but have never run damage control on an aircraft carrier.
they might have come from battleships or cruisers. Ships which you don't flood unless you absolutely have to. Versus an aircraft carrier where flooding is not done immediately if you can avoid it. If flooding is not done if you can avoid it, but uh, the moment you think you're going, you moment you think you might have to, you do it as a point of principle. You don't wait to be certain. You just, I think I might have to flood. Flood. Counter flood. Once we started leveling out, once everything has started balancing out, then. And only then, once you're balanced, do you start working through the problems. Basically, it's a process where you have to work through the problems from point A to point B to point C. You are doing damage to the ship by doing counter-flooding, but you have to do it to preserve the ship. And the earlier you do it, the earlier you stop that water in terms of being able to get... You're going to sink the ship down, which is going to allow more water in anyway... Which is a problem, but you're going to keep the vessel level. And if you can keep your watertight doors closed, if you can keep everything organised as much as possible, yes, you'll be lower in the water, but you should, should be able to keep the vessel afloat. Now, one of the things we have to be quite lucky for, I say we are quite lucky with, is that she actually is in, uh, serves in the hunter-killer anti-submarine groups along with Courageous. In fact, the Royal Navy deployed three submarine hunter-killer groups at the beginning of World War II, centred on Hermes, Courageous, and Ark Royal. The idea was that, of course, the carrier-borne aircraft would increase area search and range of attacking submarines, but of course, full fleet carriers being used in this role makes for tempting, very tempting targets. And whilst Hermes being in this role is absolutely perfect on upper street, and I would argue Argus would have been sensible for this role. So, you know, there are airships available, of ships, well, in Argus' case, theoretically available, which would have been suitable for the role. Honestly, using Courageous and Ark Royal was probably reprehensible, other than the Royal Navy had lots of, lots of exercises which appeared to justify it as a viable option. Forgetting that those exercises had been conducted in scenarios which as the, the exercises the exercise have been false positives. Because the exercises were conducted in confined areas. So as Dick is tested thoroughly, everything is tested thoroughly, but actually you're testing your you're testing your operations in a scenario where you know your enemy sub has to be somewhere in this area. No, you don't know where they are in that area, but you know they have to be in somewhere in that area. And that has meant it's been a false positive, because in sometimes what that had happened was the carrier could, of course, sit outside the area and launch her aircraft in. And so she carried was easier to secure against the submarine and all sorts of things. We sit there and go, mm, you can't do that. She actually managed to uh, go through several near misses in her early career. She was helping out with the rescue of the HMS Spearfish, which had been damaged by German warships off the Horn Reefs. And, um, well, she's escorting it back. Uh, with Nelson and Rodney also providing escort, basically going, anyone want to come and attack Ark Royal? Anyone? Anyone? We're here. You know, HMS Nelson and Rodney doing their usual thing of, we have nine 16 guns apiece and we're waiting. We have nine 16 inch guns apiece and we're waiting. They spend quite a lot of World War II waiting for someone to come close, because again, they're, they're not often fast enough to catch them. I know Nice now almost gets caught by Rodney, but to be fair, that was Nice now's fault. Uh, as a rule, the enemy it has to be slowed down for one of those to, to actually catch them up. When they do, they're devastating, but, you know. But still, they're with Ark Royal and hoping uh, some sort of surface threat comes out to try and attack her, because... And instead, they get uh, four Junker 88s coming and attack her. But they're driven away by a combination of fighters, anti-aircraft fire. Well, three of them are. 
fourth managed to actually launch its bomb at the carrier. Arc Royal turned to starboard. Healed over. Which is not something you want to do in a carrier, but does show the issue with her stability and metacentric height, because she is quite a tall vessel that she actually does heal over quite so violently. And as such, the bomb landed in the ocean 100 feet off her starboard bow. This is when you get the first scenario of the Germans reporting they have sunk Ark Royal. Because later on, another reconnaissance flight locates the two battleships, but not Ark Royal. This actually means that Winston Churchill has to reassure in person on the phone, Roosevelt, that the carrier was un undamaged and invited the US naval attaché to view Ark Royal sitting in dock. Uh, the British naval attaché in Rome also assured Benito Mussolini that the ship was still in service. And uh, this suitably embarrassed the Germans and their Nazi propaganda machine, which is, of course, why Ark Royal then becomes number one target. Using the old rule of bullies everywhere. I, bully, I, I tried to gloat over beating you. It turned out I hadn't beaten you. And now you've made me look bad, so it's all your fault, and I must destroy you to uh, to restore my own status. Please note, there is someone here complaining about lack of biscuits, I think. Ugh, hello. Anyway, it is from this moment onwards that she becomes basically a marked ship. And so when she's taking part in the hunt in the grass bay, Sailing around in Force K with HMS Renown in the South Atlantic, she is a marked ship. When she and Renown are charging towards Montevideo going, please, please come out, please come out, Grass Bay, or stay in and my aircraft will come and say hello to you, she is a marked ship. Hello, I, I need to move my notes. Thank you. And after hunting down the grass bay, or rather, after the grass bay has been sunk, she helps escort HMS Exeter back to Devonport for her repairs. And she then herself sails to Portsmouth for supplies and sails on, uh, sails on the Scarpa Flow, where she transfers her skewers to Hass Hatson, that's near the name of the air station up there, to strengthen the anchorage's defences. As at this point, she's assigned to the Mediterranean fleet. And she starts to depart Scuffalow in March 1940, heading for Alexandria along with HMS Glorious. They arrived in eastern Mediterranean on 8th April, but exercises were cancelled on the 9th, and then they had to sail to Gibraltar to wait orders because of the prospective Norway campaign. But that's a really interesting scenario because if you have the scenario that if you had Glorious and Ark Royal in the Eastern Mediterranean at the same time as the Italian fleet was in Taranto, if Italy had declared war at that point, well, Ark Royal and Glorious launching that strike together, they could both launch roughly 40, 48 uh, swordfish. Let's say, let, let, let's say they get off. 84 swordfish between them. That's more than a three and a half times the strike that actually hit Toronto. It's a dizzying what if. But no, her and Glorious actually managed to sail from Gibraltar and reach Scarpa Flow and start taking part in the operations off Norway. And again, she's a marked ship. The Germans want to sink her, they want to claim that honour. Ark 
after Ark Royal, well, no, after Norway, Ark Royal is sent to the Mediterranean. And she's sent there because of the fall of France. And she's sent along with HMS Hood and three destroyers. When France finally capitulates, Somville is ordered to carry out Mers al Kabir. Or rather, to go to Mers al Kabir and give them the options. That's the mission for Mers al Kabir. Go give options. Either you sail to Caribbean, or you sail to Britain. So it's pretty much the preferred options. Or we sink you. But we cannot afford your fleet to fall into the hands of the Nazis. We cannot afford, uh, afford your fleet to become under the control of Germany. Their navy is weak. Yours is fairly capable, France. We can't afford this. I've done Mers al Kabir before, but all that happen uh, what Ark Royal does during this operation is mainly provide targeting information, spotting, as I've been over before. Spotting, as in providing targeting information to battleships, is probably one of the most powerful weapons an aircraft carry aircraft can be used for during their attack on Mers al Kabir. And when the Strasbourg escaped, she was attacked by the swordfish from the Ark Royal, and then two days later um, aircraft from the Ark Royal further incapacitated the Dunkirk, which had been beached in the initial attack. Her time with Force H... Oh, she just does so much. But... Especially important in 1940 is her covering the transition of Illustrious to the Eastern, to the Mediterranean fleet. From the Western to the Eastern Basin in the Mediterranean. It was important that they got the ships near where they needed to be for the operators that were going to be take part. And again, what else did she get used for? During Taranto. While Illustrious conducts Taranto and hopefully that the plan had been for her and Eagle to be involved, Ark Royal, which the Italians know is the Royal Navy's Alpha Strike Strike Crew uh, Carrier, the, the thing that they are really have to worry about, is off doing attacks in Genoa and various other places. Going to Italians, look at me! I'm your favourite target! You all keep wanting to sink me! Well, don't I look lovely? Come and give it a go. I'm here. Basically, Ark Royal spends quite a large chunk of her time being a version of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Basically, they seek him here, they seek him there, they seek him everywhere. And she's good at it. Especially Renown. Occasionally, they even tag up with Malaya as well. This is a really interesting odd couple scenario because you have Malaya doing her Queenless of Class uh, un... How do I put this? Unimproved much best to keep up and to provide the heavy mix, heavy firepower while Ark Royal and Renown are dancing around the places going, hello? But of course Malaya had not been as modernised as Warspite Valiant or Queen Elizabeth. Again, not for lack of shipyards, Britain. Not for lack of shipyards. In fact, there's a really cool picture of her with Renown I have in here. There you go. This one up here. And there's this one as well, which is when they're under air attack. And you can see them blasting away. And you can see, basically, Ark Royal is... Somewhere in this area. And Renown is here. 
and you can see that the level of fire going off in the air. They were a very good couple, a very good pair of ships. They balance each other very well. She was involved, of course, in the hunt for Bismarck, and it was her aircraft which managed to slow the Bismarck down. Which is one of the sad things that Renown isn't allowed in on the final sinking of the Bismarck, because, well, it's Ark Royal, it's Force H, which slows Bismarck down. And Renown had been hoping to get close and personal with Bismarck, but that didn't wasn't allowed, and they had to wait and let King George V and HMS Rodney go in and, well... Finish the, uh, finish the poor Bismarck off by that point. I will say poor Bismarck because she was wounded, she was going around and around in circles, and she didn't really have much of a chance. She was also had spent a night being tormented by travel class destroyers. I, I think in terms of ship experience, that's probably got up to, it got, up, uh, got to be up there as a, a nightmare for any warship. On 10th of November 1941, Ark Royal was ferrying air more aircraft to Malta before returning to Gibraltar. And this is long after Bismarck. Somerville had been warned of U-boats operating on the Spanish coast and had instructed all his captains to remain as vigilant as possible. At 15.40 hours on the 30th of November, HMS Legion detected an unidentified sound. But, crucially, she assumed they were propellers of a nearby destroyer. One minute later, Ark Royal was struck amidships by a torpedo. This is probably the worst spot to get hit. As it's between the fuel bunkers and the bomb store, and directly below the bridge. The explosion caused Ark Royal to shake, hurled fully loaded torpedo bombers into the air, and killed 44-year-old able seaman Edward Mitchell, who was the only man to die in the sinking. It did all this while punching a 130 foot by 30 foot, that's 40 meters by 9 meter hole in the ship's bottom and starboard side, below the water line. after running deep and hitting the bilge keel inboard of the side protection system, which didn't go the full way down. Again, this was weight saving to keep it under the treaty limits. And that's not the individual ship treaty limits, that's to keep it under the overall treaty limits so they can get enough ships within the treaty limits. You have to remember there's always two figures you're fighting with, the individual ship limit and your cumulative limit. And if you want enough ships, you've got to build it well underneath the individual ship limit to uh, to try and get enough ships within the cumulative, cumulative limit. The hit caused flooding, and surprisingly, in the starboard boiler room, the main switchboard, oil tanks, and over roughly 32 metres or 106 feet of the ship's starboard bilge. It also knocked out all internal communications and the starboard powertrain, and caused the rear half of the ship to lose power. This is her, with HMS Legion alongside, trying to recover everyone she could. After the strike, Captain Maund ordered the engines to full stop. He had to do so by sending a runner to the engine room. The ship's continued motion enlarged the hole in the hull. And by the time she'd stopped, she was starting to list the starboard, reaching 18 degrees from centre within 20 minutes. Now, at this point, it's quite sensible someone needed to have been doing counterflooding from almost a get-go. But as said, there is a debate still at this point. And you can really see, she has, she's has she been hit starboard side, which is the worst side for her to hit because of the island and all the other structure and all the other weight which is there. Water coming in makes this side even heavier, which defuncts the stuff which is to balance it all on this side.
Now, considering what had happened with Courageous and Glorious, Morn at this point gives the order to abandon ship because those ships have been lost quickly, but seems to forget that one of those had been lost to multiple torpedoes being hit quickly in the North Atlantic, uh, and the other one had been Shan Horse nice now shelling her to pieces. But no, Maund gives the order to abandon ship. The crew are assembled on the flight deck, and they determine who would remain on board to try to save the ship, while Legion would take off the rest. This actually delays more damage control measures taking place until 49 minutes after the attack, and this, frankly, is criminal. This is the point at which you do have problem. Down. Down. <laughs> Never work with children, animals, especially not floppies who want the biscuits. Come. Right. As a result of this, or the damage control measures not being taken until initiating until 40 minutes after the attack, the flooding had spread unchecked, exacerbated by covers and hatches which had been left open because it was a mass evacuation order. So you've got order, you've got three issues compounding themselves here. One, the fact that there had been a debate going on about how to do it, whether or not to follow the instructions in the manual or whether they, the, the manual was right. You've got the fact that You've got delay in communications caused by loss of communication system, but that's a context. You've got Morn's decision to try and order evacuation because of the previous carriers sinking so quickly. And you've got the fact that because he ordered an evacuation, this then put the ship in a worse state to try and repair and support it. Water spread to the central, a central line boiler room, which started to flood from below. So power was lost shipwide when the boiler uptakes become choked. Arc Royal had no backup diesel generators. Now, this is a bad point of design. About half an hour after an explosion, the carrier appeared to stabilize. Somerville was determined to save Arc Royal, ordered damage control parties back to the carrier before taking Malaya to Gibraltar in organized, to organize salvage efforts. Frankly, you do wonder what would have happened if, if Somerville had been aboard Arc Royal. Um, if the Admiral had been aboard the carrier. I have a feeling that it might have been a different scenario because Maund was so in his head about the losses and how quickly Courageous and Glorious had gone that he doesn't get into damage control mode and his damage control officers aren't in that mode. They should have just reacted without even the captain's orders, but doing that without the captain's orders is a big step. Whereas if the captain just got, told them to start damage control, it would have been different. At this point, the destroyer Lafore uh, comes uh, comes alongside to provide power, additional pumps, and sawfish aircraft from Gibraltar fly overhead to supplement the anti-submarine patrols. The tug Thames arrives from Gibraltar at 20 hundred hours. So, remember, she is still afloat. She's still afloat four hours and 20 minutes later. Attaches a tow line to Ark Royal, but the flooding had caused the ship to list even more severely. Rising water had reached the boiler room fan flat, which is an uninterrupted compartment running the width of the ship. This forced a shutdown of the restored boiler. So they got a boiler working, and then the water reaches a point which they can't stop it. The list reached 20 degrees at 0205 hours, and, well, some point between 0205 and 0230 hours. An abandoned ship was declared again at 0400 hours when the list reached 27 degrees. They'd managed to, to complete the evacuation to Legion by 0430 hours, and so there are no facilities other than Mitchell. The 1,487 officers and crew are transported to Gibraltar. The list reached 45 degrees before Ark Royal capsized and sank at 0619 hours on the 14th of November. The 14th of November. Witnesses who were watching reported the carrier rolled to 90 degrees where she remained for three minutes before sinking. 
then broke in two, and the half, the half sinking of a couple of minutes uh, followed by the bow. Now, Captain Maund was found guilty. He was found guilty on two counts of negligence. One of failing to ensure that properly constituted damage control parties had remained on board after the general evacuation, and one, for, and the second point, failing to ensure the ship was in sufficient state of readiness to deal with possible damage. Now, they did say that, you know, that High Stand was being expected and mourned, and he was primarily concerned with welfare of his crew, for which they did accept. But, pretty much, his, uh, how do I put this politely? He ends up getting to Rear Admiral. But he had been a high-flying officer, who was expecting to get to very senior points. He doesn't get much further. In fact, he when he returns to, uh, to the UK, 1st of October 1944 until July 1945, he serves as Rear Admiral Landing Ships and Craft. As Acting Rear Admiral. He's uh, promoted to actual substantial Rear Admiral on 1st of March 1946. I'd also add that um, he wrote a book called Assault from the Sea, which was his account of the development of the Royal Navy's landing craft and their use operation between 1959 and 1945, and it really is worth a read. Maund is not a bad guy, but he was also not a Captain Cedric Holland, who'd commanded Ark Royal previously, and he... He was react he he was so in his head about the loss of the previous carriers he didn't think hang on this is a different ship and the fact that she did manage to float and stay a long uh, stay afloat so long if they had started counter flooding earlier as the instruction manuals, as the manuals say or damage control if they had done proper parties in those first forty five minutes. That have been and they've been closing up doors, etc., and everything else. The odds are they could have got her into port. Because let's be honest, if she was listing at merely twenty degrees, they could have got her in there. But in a nicest way, earlier she had been listing a lot less than twenty degrees. Even with her massive amount of damage, you have. A good few minutes to start doing damage control. If they had shut down compartments. If they had followed the manual, as Morn should have got his crew to do, because it's not in—it's one of the things you expect of a captain. It's—you have to give them to accept. You have to accept that you're not the person in the room. But also, they are the person who's had 20, 30 years training and experience doing these things. Their job is to be the calm person in that scenario. So the buck does stop there. The Bucknell Committee also added to his protection in that they said that the, they were always set up to investigate loss of major warships. And they argued that the lack of backup power sources was a major design failure and contributed to her loss. Ark Royal depended on electricity for pretty much all of her operation. And once the boilers and the steam driven dynos were knocked out, the loss of power made damage control very difficult. Now, they also recommended that the design of bulkheads and boiler intakes be improved to decrease the risk of widespread flooding in boiler rooms and machine spaces. And the uninterrupted boiler room flat was incompletely, it was of course criticised because that went from side to side of the, sh of the hull. Now, I would point out, and this is going to sound terrible, but I would point out there is often a point made that people go, this was rectified in the illustrious class vessels which under design and construction and design at the time. Okay. Illustrious was launched in 19, for April 1939, commissioned May 1940. Formidable was launched in August 1939, commissioned November 1940. Victorious was launched in September 1939 and commissioned in May 1941. Indomitable was launched in March 1940 and commissioned in October 1941. 
I'm not sure which is the person who decided to include the illustrious class in the idea of this, but they were all commissioned by the time Ark Royal was lost. More importantly, the inquiry doesn't get finished till February 1942, so even with the implacable class, Implacable being launched in December 1942 and Indefatigable launched in in, also in December 1942 after having been laid down in March, November 1939. There is time. Things can be changed around, but it's, it's going to be an interesting case. It's going to be retrofitting. What I would say more likely, and in fact this is what I would say is closer to the truth, Eagle. Ark Royal of the Audacious class. Those vessels. H Eagle was, of course, originally HMS Audacious herself, and Ark Royal was originally going to be HMS Irresistible, and that was Eagle in Africa. But it's supposed to be for those ships, their designs are going to be heavily influenced by the report. But I'm sorry. Illustrious class, it would be retrofitting, and it would not. It's not. It's not designing. It's retrofitting and redesigning, and it's going to take them. It would have taken them out of operations to do any major work. But still, Ark Royal was a good ship. She was a useful ship, and she served the Royal Navy well for the years of war she provided. And her loss like the losses of Courageous and Glorious, ultimately can argue to be unpreventable if the Royal Navy had followed its own procedures and rules. In this case, it's not an admiral not following procedure in terms of um, the loss of Glorious, in that she should not have been going home with just two destroyers as escort. The Royal Navy has rules from exercises about this. And in Courageous's case, yeah, Let's use our fleet carriers for the submarine hunting. Because whilst in theory we're supposed to use our smaller carriers, we've only got Hermes and that's not enough. So let's use Ark Royal and Courageous. Oh. Bright ideas. Sometimes the good idea fairy just is so strong in the world. Anyway. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and the question for HMS Ark Royal? Well, it's quite simple, this, really. Damage control goes well. They actually react within those, four, instead of 45, 45, 49 minutes of them just evacuating the ship and not closing doors, they do proper damage control. Maybe they, they still do an evacuation, but they actually start locking down the hull, locking down stuff so the water can't make further progress. They maybe do a bit of counter-flooding. They manage to get her to safety, to Gibraltar. She gets repaired. Probably in the east coast of the United States. Maybe gets taken to the west coast, but that's going to be a long way around. Whereas the east coast, you can just about get her there. Or she's going to go back to Camel Lairds. Depends whether you think it's safer to take her up the Bay of Biscay and into the Irish Sea or whether you think it's safer to try and get her across the uh, North Atlantic. You decide. What impact does this have on the rest of World War II? Her survival. Her viability. I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you very much for watching, and um, take care. Doodles. Howdy! So, you've no doubt noticed that some bits of this have been added into and changed. Well, I got home, 
and I checked all the videos. And Ark Royal seemed fine when I played it through on the normal checking which I did on YouTube, which is about one and a half to two time to one and three quarters time speed. So I can listen to the full hour long video. Seemed fine. But I got worried. You see This one is always going to be more personal for me. It has a lot of primary research information in it. It has a lot of non-primary research information, i.e. stuff which I just got out of Mike Rossiter's book, Ark Royal, because frankly, why not? It's an absolutely excellent resource on my, put together by Mike Rossiter. It's worthwhile reading. I don't agree with everything in it. But there again, if you show me any book I agree with everything in it, it definitely won't even be my own book, because... There are things in my book which I write because there are th those are the things I can prove with an evidentiary document I can point to. Not necessarily always what I think about, uh, think is actually happened based on the other end evidence and context I've read around it. It's the same with this. And it's the same with other videos I've done in this series. Um, HMS Renown is a good example of it. I had to keep very factual because a book which I only found, and this is probably going to collapse on me now, while travelling in Australia, an absolutely excellent book, but I only found it while travelling in Australia. If I can stick that back in there, that should hold it up. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, James Hornfisher. So... This, HMS Round Book. I am going around hunting for all these historical books. But the trouble is, they aren't all they aren't all in the same places. And yeah, I will probably visit revisit some of the key series ships book, uh, ships videos, and I might well add in whole sections. Whole other sections. This one is Renown's 1920s. It's really worth a read. But try and find another copy of it. I've been looking for one for 10 years, and I got given a copy when I was in the sh uh, when I was just on one of the ships in Australia. Sometimes, sometimes these histories and history a historian will write or will record for a video is what they can prove and what is the accepted narrative because there is documents, there are books, everything answered up. It might not necessarily be 100% what they agree with, or 100% what they believe. But there is a difference. A historian always has to draw a line between what they, can be what they believe, what they think is true, what they've heard as a minor anecdote, and what they can prove. I will tend to get far more looking like I'm reading off a screen and reading from points and following underlined, bolded bits and phraseologies which I've got out of books written about something when I am more worried about possibly talking about stuff which is going to be more of a belief or anecdote than a fact, i.e. something I cannot prove as well. With Ark Royal and the story of Cam uh, the history of Camelots, that was my PhD thesis. And that whole discussion is in my PhD thesis, and it's in there because I spent four and a half months, as I said, trying to prove it all, and I couldn't find the necessary smoking gun. I couldn't. I failed. I use the phrase financial viability. Well, yeah, there's only so much time I can afford to spend in those archives. There's only so much time I can pay to be in the hotel, in the hotel or travel lodge. Um, you know, up there. I'm not back in the, uh, the back down London teaching or doing other things I need to be doing. But I still do it. I still go and search. I still keep trying to crack the documents from another side. Uh, this is one of the reasons why, when it comes to the Admiral-class battle cruiser story, I am probably one of the 
experts in the UK in terms of having in terms of if we base that expertise on terms of having read all the documents and literature around them in terms of the archival documents. Not because of an interest in the Admiral class battlecruisers per se, but an interest of exactly what where this comes from, because no other ship fits that criteria. So yeah. Renown. It's a good video, but it's a very factual video, which means I've read a lot of I've done a lot of stories and history in chronological order following it through. From the books. There is pretty much, and I can't find my copy now, but I will hopefully ha have it at some point, if people want to ask, of Peter Smith's, C. Smith's book, Renown. It's pretty much the only book written about Renown. And that's why she's on my list. Doing a decent book about Renown and Repulse, and what they get up, or rather... I'm going to call it the Royal Navy's interwar battle cruisers, and I want to do a book about what Tiger, Renown, Repulse, and Hood get up to in the 1920s and 30s. And I will do that. That's on my list of books to get to after I've done the Flower class, the U class, and a couple of other classes. There'll be 45,000 words. It might be Kindle only because I'm not sure if anyone else would like to read it, but it will be done. But when I'm doing that book, when I'm writing that book. I do realise that book will be possibly the first book in about 30 years on that topic. And it will also be the first one which will be trying to link up the activities of all four ships and trying to explain how they interact with each other and how they interact with global deterrence and Britain's international position at the time. And that's going to be a really cool book. But I don't expect it to be a particularly massive or popular book in terms of the number of people who are going to read it. And I can understand why publishers aren't that interested in it. But no. So I hope you've enjoyed Ark Royal again. Hope you don't mind I've done some quick changes in terms of getting rid of pop, pop, pops, which were turning up. And, um, yeah. Thank you for watching. And thank you for watching Renown. Thank you for watching the Keyship series. There is one more uh, key ship series video recorded after this, which is Lexington and Saratoga. And I haven't gone through that on slow yet. I'm probably going to. So it might get changed. But I hope you've enjoyed them all. Thank you and take care. Oh, and while I remember, thank you for everyone who has subscribed and has made this channel reach over 10,000 subscribers. Thank you, it's very kind of you.